In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As soon as I began to read this morning's epistle, my mind formed an image of a street preacher with a megaphone and sandwich board loudly proclaiming, the end is nigh. I usually avoid such people like the plague, or like the coronavirus, as we might now say. Their approach to the good news always seems to start with a blast of very bad news. Of course, there is a long history of doom mongery in the church. I think of all those gory medieval wall paintings. But I like to think that, in this respect at least, we live in more enlightened times and that there is something fundamentally anti-gospel about trying to scare people into faith. But of course there's always a danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, and it won't help us in the long run if we refuse to hear the words of Peter in the epistle, the end of all things is at hand. As we read on, from this opening gambit, we see that we are indeed a long way from the preacher on the street corner. There is no urge to moral panic or spiritual frenzy, far from it. Instead, Peter encourages us to be sober and prayerful, to show charity to one another and generous hospitality without grudging. Even if the early church did tend to believe that the end was rather more nigh than we now think it is, there is no sense of alarm in the epistle. The prevailing mood seems to have more in common with the sentiment attributed to Martin Luther. If I knew the world was to end tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree today. There's no evidence that Luther did actually say this. More likely, it was invented by the German Confessing Church to inspire hope and perseverance during its opposition to the Nazi regime. I think it captures beautifully the idea that no matter what happens, now is always the right time to do the right thing, the good thing, the beautiful thing, the hopeful thing. There's nothing heroic about it. It's just about doing our best to live each day as well as we can. And this helps to frame our sense of where the church is heading at this season of the liturgical year. It all started last Advent, which led into Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, and lately the Ascension. Next week, we round off all the great seasons with Pentecost, and then the week after Trinity Sunday. Then we come to the long months of what the church calls ordinary time. Now, both Peter in the epistle and Jesus in the gospel make it clear that there is nothing ordinary about the time between the Ascension and the return of Christ. I am reminded of one of the great figures of the German Confessing Church, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote about the relationship between the ultimate and the penultimate. This isn't a theological lecture, and if you want to know more about that, you can read his book Ethics. But I think it makes all the difference in the world if we understand our experience of ordinary time as penultimate rather than ultimate. This goes against the grain of so much in our culture, which takes it for granted that the way things are is just the way things are. Perhaps the coronavirus pandemic will upset the apple cart enough to shift us away from a, a laissez-faire attitude towards the global state of affairs. Maybe, maybe not. But either way, as Christians, we cannot be comfortable with the way things are. Partly, of course, because we know 
that none of it is going to last. Or to put it rather more sharply, none of us is going to last. This isn't a uniquely Christian insight, of course, even if our culture has found a million and one ways to keep it out of sight and mind. And there is more than one way to respond to it. Going back to Luther's apple tree, some people might be like the reluctant prophet Jonah, who, when he could see that things were not going to turn out the way he wanted them to, just gave up lay down under the tree and waited to die. Another option also reflected in the Bible would be to pick all the apples for food and cider, cut down the tree for fuel, that we may eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But Peter gives us a different approach. As every man hath received the gift, he writes, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Grace is the key word here, which stands for the fact that we are not self-made or self-sufficient. We are dependent, dependent upon God and upon each other. This is the Christian economy, which governs our way of life in ordinary time. Knowing that the end is nigh for us means not taking anything for granted. It gives us a spirit of gratitude, which is to say it makes us a people of Eucharist, for Eucharist means thanksgiving. And our thanksgiving is oriented three ways. We're thankful for all that God has done for us in the past. We're thankful for our daily bread and we are thankful for our eternal destiny in Christ. And in particular, it's our thanksgiving for the future, the ultimate, which gives us the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the peace and presence of mind to plant apple trees, to be sober and prayerful, to show charity to one another and generous hospitality without grudging. Whatever our experience of ordinary time, the ups and downs of our everyday lives, we neither give up nor do we grasp, but by the grace of God, we give thanks. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.